I, I apologize for the delay. I, I <laughs> good morning to everyone. I was locked out of the um, meeting. <laughs> okay, today we are going. Um, we are going to talk about the anatomy and physiology of the pharynx and larynx. Um, the objectives are to discuss the basic anatomy and to enumerate the main functions of the pharynx and larynx. Uh, before we start, we are going to watch this short video. See the anatomy of the larynx. So first we will see the extension.
Uh, thank you. Uh, with that brief video, so we can continue. Um, this is what we have talked about. Uh, the, the pharynx is behind the nose, behind the mouth. And behind, which is incomplete anteriorly, situated behind the nasal cavity, the mouth and the larynx. Uh, it extends from the skull base, as you saw, to the entrance into the esophagus opposite the sixth cervical vertebrae. It's the common, it's the common entrance to the respiratory and alimentary canals. Uh, it's made out of three portions from up to down. We have the nasopharynx, the oropharynx, and high post of the laryngopharynx. Uh, you, you will note that the nasopharynx is the only part of the pharynx that only conducts air, whereas the oropharynx and the hypopharynx conduct both air and wood. Uh, it starts from the midline. of the neck from the skull base to the esophagus, as we saw, and we said it's behind the nose, the, or the mouth and the larynx. It is an irregular fibromuscular tube that's lined by mucosa inside. And in adults, it is 15 centimeters in length, as you can see from the skull base, that is a basic occiput, to the esophagus, uh, it is roughly 15 centimeters in length. Uh, it's made out of four components. It's layers. The layers of the wall of the pharynx uh, have, 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 four, have four layers. Um, we, the first layer from inside to outside, we have the mucosa membrane. Uh, the mucosa, that's the inside lining of the um, of the pharynx, and we note that it is pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium in the nasal pharynx, whereas in the wrist, the, nas uh, the oropharynx and the hypopharynx, it is stratified squamous epithelium. So the mucosa in the nasal pharynx is continuous with the mucosa of the nose, which is respiratory epithelium. So respiratory epithelium, which also extends into the ustachian tube and projects into the tympanic cavity. So the mucosa in the nasal pharynx is similar to the one in the nose, also similar to the one in the nasal, in the ustachian tube, and also in the middle ear. The second layer after the mucosa beneath, which is also the submucosa, we have the pharyngeal aponeurosis. It's also called the pharyngobacillar fascia. Uh, this layer is composed of loose connective tissue that contains the lymphoid tissue that aggregates in some areas to form what we call tonsils, also known as the Waldeas ring. Uh, the third layer is the muscle layer. Uh, which is formed by three muscles, the superior, middle, and inferior constrictor muscles. Uh, these are the constrictor muscles. However, we have three other adrenal muscles, uh, the salpingo pharyngeus, the stylopharyngeus, and the palatopharyngeus muscles, as we shall see in, in the next slide. Um, the fourth layer, the fourth, so those are the muscles. We have the superior, you see the arrow, the middle, and the inferior constrictor muscles. And you know that they all another. Uh, the fourth layer, which is the layer you can see beneath here, is what we call the bucopharyngeal fascia. 
the buccopharyngeal fascia. That's the tough layer that is surrounding the entire pharynx. So the pharynx has four layers which make up its wall. Um, we have the mucosa, we have the pharyngeal aponeurosis, which is also called the pharyngobasilar fascia. We have the mu uh, muscle layer and the buccopharyngeal fascia. So we said in its second layer, which is the submucosa, also known as the pharyngobasilar fascia, we have aggregates of lymphoid tissue. Uh, these aggregates of lymphoid tissue end up forming what we call the Waldeas ring. The Waldeas ring is also the inner a ring of lymphatic tissue that aids or provides protection to young children when they're still young, to children when they're still young, to prevent them from getting severe aerodigestive diseases by being the first line of defense. So your Waldeas ring is, um, is, is the first line of defense when you're young from the age of uh, one month or two weeks of age when they get exposed to the, the antigens in the environment to the age of five, because we, 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 we will understand that adenoids start regressing by the age of five, whereas the tonsils start regressing by the age of 12. So their role becomes uh, irrelevant or a little bit taken over by the bone marrow, the thymus, the spleen, as the patient grows with age. So the lymphoid tissue in the pharyngeal aponeurosis aggregates in some areas forming what we call the tonsils. Uh, we have one nasopharyngeal tonsil, which is found in the nasopharynx just behind the nose at the roof of the nasopharynx. This is also known as adenoid when it gets sick. When it is sick, it's called adenoid. When it's not, um, Sick, we call it the nasopharyngeal or pharyngeal tonsil. We have two tonsils on either side of your uvula, uh, which we call the palatine tonsils. And we have had people say, I have tonsils. So, the, <laughs> so those are the ones people talk about. These are the two palatine tonsils formed between the two pillars of the oropharynx, as we shall see. And uh, then we have two lingual tonsils. The lingual tonsils are formed at the base of the tongue. As you can see, this is your tongue. These are the lingual tonsils. And then we have the tubal and gelach tonsils. These are found in the nasal pharynx on the side of the crustacean tube orifice, as we shall see later. So those are tubal and gelach. And then we end with the mucosal aggregates of lymphoid tissue, which we also call the mouth. It is found along the posterior wall of the pharynx. Uh, those are the five groups of lymphatic tissues that congregate and form what we call the Waldeas ring. Uh, the nasal pharynx, <clears throat> the nasal pharynx is that we have seen, the nasopharynx communicates with the nasal cavity through the corona. And it extends from the skull base superiorly to the soft palate inferiorly. Okay, this is the hard palate, it's in a uh, hard palate, soft palate, and the nasopharynx ends here at the soft palate inferiorly opposite C, C3, as we saw, C2, sorry, C2, as we saw in the video. Um, it communicates inferiorly with the oropharynx, that green arrow, the oropharynx what, uh, via what we call the veropharyngeal sphincter. And the nasal uh, pharyngeal tonsil lies in the roof. Uh, In the adenoid and the pharyngo, pharyngeal opening of the ossetian tube lies in the lateral walls of the nasopharynx. That's why if you sneeze, you increase sudden pressures in your nose, you hear the ear pop. Or when you swallow, you can feel the ear open. So that's because the ossetian tube is opposite, is opposite that. 
it's in the lateral wall of the nasopharynx. Uh, the soft palate cuts it off from the rest of the pharynx during uh, swallowing, preventing food regurgitating into the nasal pharynx. The orifice of the pharyngotympanic or the ostation tube lies on the side of on the side wall of with the floor of the nose. The ostation tube. Opening is situated 1.25 centimeters behind the posterior end of the inferior cabinet and is bordered superiorly by an elevation, and that elevation is called torus tuberius. So the torus tuberius uh, can is, is what we find above the, the hole where the station tube opens. And um, Above this elevation, we have uh, a fossa or a recess, which we call the fossa of frozen molar. Fossa of frozen molar is important because most of the cancers in the nasal pharynx, they, this, they originate from the fossa of frozen molar. Uh, the functions of the nasal pharynx include conduit air, uh, ventilation of the middle ear and equalization of pressure via the ostation tube elevates the soft palate, uh, cutting off the passive arch reach or the very fine sphincter uh, from the uh, cutting off the nasal pharynx from the oropharynx. The resonating chamber during voice production, uh, you've noted that when your nose is blocked, or when you have a problem with the nasopharynx, your voice will change because it's a resonating chamber. And it's also helpful in drainage of secretions directly from the nose. And those are the secretions you swallow. Um, the oropharynx. Uh, the oropharynx is situated in front of the second, that ring, you see that ring? In front of the second and third cervical vertebrae. It starts from the soft palate to the tip of the epiglottis inferiorly. So this is the tip of the soft palate, which is made by the ovula. The ovula is a sondavula, that structure that hangs, and the tip of the epiglottis inferiorly. Uh, it communicates anteriorly with the oropharynx, superiorly with the nasopharynx, and inferiorly with the hypo. It contains the palatine tonsils and the lingual tonsils, and the palatine tonsils are formed between the anterior and posterior pillar. So the anterior pillar is made up of a muscle called the palatoglossus muscle, because it starts from the soft palate to the tongue, and then the posterior pillar is made from uh, the palatopharyngeus muscle. Palatopharyngeus muscle is starting from the soft palate to the pharynx. So it's called the palatopharyngeus muscle. And between them, they, they, you see they connect to the ovula and between them you have the palatine tonsils. Um, the interval between, the interval between the two, anterior pillars or the paratoglossus muscles uh, is called the oropharyngeal isthmus. It what separates the mouth from the oropharynx. Um, the flow, the flow of the, we shall see in the image next. Uh, the flow is formed by the posterior one third of the tongue and it's it's between it's the interval between the tongue and the epiglottis. So in the midline, that flow is divided by the median glossal epiglottic folds. And um, on each side, we have the lateral glossal epiglottic folds. Between these two folds, the median and the lateral, we have what we call the molecular. So on each side of the median, as you can see. So uh, this is the epiglottis, the tip, 
So this space that's between the base of tongue and the epiglottis is what we call the follicular. And the follicular is also part of the oral pharynx. And it's divided into two, right and left, by the median glossal epiglottic fold. Uh, as you can see, I think I have an image. So this is an oropharyngoscopic view of a, a patient in clinic. You can see this is the uvula, this is the anterior pillar, this is the posterior pillar, and, and in between you can see these are the tonsils. This is the tongue that has been depressed. And this is the posterior wall, the posterior wall of the pharynx. And you see these swellings, they are called cobalt stonings, and they are the malt, the mucosal aggregates of lymphoid tissue. Our functions of the oral pharynx, we have conduit for passage of food and air, a pharyngeal phase of swallowing. It's a vocal tract for certain speech sounds. Some speech sounds are uh, originating the oral pharynx. Uh, it also helps us to appreciate taste because of the base of the tongue and local defense and immunity uh, because of the palatine tonsils. Um, the hypopharynx is the third part of the pharynx, third division of the pharynx, and it starts from in front of the third cervical vertebrae to the sixth cervical vertebrae. Uh, it starts from the tip of the epiglottis tip of the epiglottis to the lower border of your cricoid cartilage. And it communicates anteriorly with the larynx, superiorly with the oropharynx, and inferiorly with esophagus. So esophagus, that's the conduit for food, whereas the larynx, that's the conduit for, for air. Uh, the hypopharynx not only lies behind the larynx, as you saw, but it also, this is the larynx, because the epiglottis, as we shall see, is a component of the larynx. But it also projects around, laterally around the larynx, giving you what we call the piriform sinus. And the postcricoid region is the space behind the, the larynx, as you can see. So the hypopharynx is made out of two um, parts, components. We have the postcricoid region, which is continuous with the esophagus, and the parts that project on either side of the larynx, what we call the piriform sinus. Uh, the pharyngeal muscles, we said we have two, we have two. the constrictor muscles and the longitudinal muscles. Uh, the constrictor muscles, we have the superior, middle, and inferior. They are arranged, placed one inside the other, so they overlap each other. And they open, they are open uh, at the entrance of the nose, the mouth, and the larynx. Uh, each constrictor muscle comes from its attachment and inserts on the median raphe along the posterior aspect of the pharynx. So they, they at, the, at the back, at the posterior wall beneath, we have what we call the median raphe, where we have the attachment of the constrictor muscles. And they're all covered by the bucopharyngeal, the silopharyngeus, the and the palato ranges muscles and muscle helps um that uh, 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 an individual to swallow and open the station tube when they are swallowing so it is responsible for opening your station tube when you are swallowing so superior middle and inferior constrictor muscles. And as we say, they insert in the midline graphic. So if you have a, we shall see that in the next slide. 
Uh, blood supply is from branches of the external carotid artery. Uh, the um, branches we have the tonsillar artery, the ascending palatine artery, ascending pharyngeal artery, and the descending palatine artery, and the dorsalis lingual artery. These are the five branch of uh, uh, feeders into the pharynx, and the venous train uh, collects into the pharyngeal venous plexus and ends up in the internal jugular vein. Uh, lymphatic drainage, lymphatic drainage is in the nasal pharynx, goes to the retropharyngeal space. Uh, the retropharyngeal space, we are going to talk about it um, briefly. And then it proceeds to the upper deep cervical lymph nodes, uh, level two lymph nodes, as we saw in the beginning lecture. Nerve supply, uh, the motor supply comes from uh, vagus, um, except for style of oranges muscle, which is supplied by cranial nerve nine, and the tensor veli palatini, which is supplied by cranial nerve five. Uh, these muscles form, these two muscles contribute to your soft palate. Uh, this one, the, the tensor veli palatini, whereas the style of oranges muscle is just coming from the styloid process to the pharynx. Uh, the sensory, within the nasopharynx, we have the maxillary branch. And in the oropharynx, we have a uh, glossopharyngeal nerve supplying the sensation. And the laryngopharynx uh, is supplied by the vagus nerve the internal branch of the superior laryngeal nerve. Autonomic is from the submandibular ganglion and also parasympathetics are through the facial nerve. The facial nerve is responsible for the test sensation at the posterior tongue. No, the facial nerve is responsible for the is for the mucus glands and the um, test. So uh, physiology of swallowing is important when we talk about the pharynx. Uh, during swallowing, the oral, the nasal, and the laryngeal openings are closed off to prevent regurgitation of food through them. Each of these is guarded by a highly effective sphincter. And the nasopharynx is closed off by elevation of the soft palate. At the same time, the tensor palatini opens the ossetian tube so that when you're swallowing, the, the pressures do not um, overwhelm the middle ear. The oropharyngeal isthmus is partially blocked by the contraction of the palatoglossus muscle on each side, narrowing the space between the anterior pillars. And the residual gap is closed by the dosum of the tongue wedging into it. Um, we should also note that the larynx, as we shall see, is closed off by the epiglottis, that false vocal cords and true vocal cords are guarding it when a person is swallowing. That's why it's not advised to eat and talk at the same time. Uh, this is a short video to show you swallowing. Swallowing occurs in two stages, the oral pregnant and the subclinic stage.
Okay. Um, so uh, there are two um, pathologies that we talk about when we talk about the anatomy of the pharynx. Uh, the first one is Zenka's diverticulum. Uh, the Zenka's diverticulum, the old uh, pharyngeal porch, is um, a herniation, like a hernia of mucosa and submucosa through adhesency. Um, the inferior constrictor muscle is made up of two components. We have the thyropharyngeus muscle, which is uh, oblique, and the transverse part, which is called the cricopharyngeus muscle. So the thyropharyngeus muscle and the cricopharyngeus muscle are all components of the inferior constrictor muscle. Uh, between those two muscles, we have what we call the Killian's dehiscency. It's a triangular space that's between the two muscles. Uh, the mucosa and submucosa of the pharynx may bulge through this area and form what we call a pharyngeal port. Uh, this could be because of the incoordination, muscle incoordination, or spasm of the cricopharyngeus muscle. The cricopharyngeus muscle, whereas it's part of the inferior constrictor muscle, it also forms the upper esophageal sphincter. Backward extension is prevented by the prevertebral fascia and it pushes the esophagus aside when that pouch has formed uh, the, soft, uh, the esophagus aside and food, usually the food bolus will accumulate and cause dysphagia and cachexia and may possibly spill into the larynx causing what you call aspiration. Um, uh, usually these patients come in with dysphagia and regurgitation of undigested food. So this is the pharyngeal porch. It's between the inferior constrictor muscle, which is made out of the oblique fibers of the thyropharyngeus muscle and the transverse fibers of the cricopharyngeus muscle. And this is herniation of both the mucosa and submucosa. So when a patient is swallowing and the food bolus is formed, food will collect in this bag and that causes trouble. Um, usually the cricopharyngeus muscle is what forms your upper esophageal sphincter. So if it's spasm, you can get herniation of the mucosa. Uh, the other space that you have to know is called the retropharyngeal space. That is a space that is found behind the pharynx and it's divided in the midline portion by the median raphe. We say the median raphe is the attachment for all your constrictor muscles. And anteriorly, it's bordered by the bucopharyngeal fascia. The bucopharyngeal fascia, as we saw, is the fourth wall of your pharynx, fourth layer of your pharynx, and posteriorly by the pre vertebral fascia. Uh, it extends from the skull base to the bifurcation of the trachea, and it contains the retropharyngeal nodes, which may disappear by the age of three to four years of age. Uh, so that's the end of the, of the pharynx. As we saw, it's divided into three parts. It has four layers. Each part has a, uh, the nasopharynx, oropharynx, and, and hypopharynx we have been able to appreciate. And we also saw that if you get weakness in, if you get spasm in your cricopharyngeus, you get a pharyngeal porch. And the space behind the pharynx is called the retropharyngeal space. So briefly, we are going to watch this video are regarding the larynx, and then we shall proceed. Doctor, there is no sound. 
There's no sound. Yes, there's I no can sound. hear the sound. artery and provides sensory innervation to the mucosa superior to the vocal folds. And next is the external laryngeal nerve, which travels with the superior thyroid artery and provides motor innervation to the cricothyroid muscles. And next are the recurrent laryngeal nerves. So one is right, another one is left. The right one loops under the subclavian artery and the left one loops under the arch of iota and both ascend posterior to the esophagus and enter the larynx at the level of cricothyroid articulation and motor innervation 
of all muscles of the larynx except the cricothyroids are uh, explained over here in the nerve section of the larynx and provide sensory innervation to the mucosa of the larynx inferior to the vocal folds and the next is arteries of the larynx what is the superior laryngeal artery which is the branch of superior thyroid artery and travels with the internal laryngeal nerve and next one is the inferior laryngeal artery which is a branch of inferior thyroid artery and it travels along with the recurrent laryngeal nerve so this is what we discussed about uh, the anatomy as well as the physiology of larynx so as we saw that the larynx is also known as your voice box uh, it's made out of muscles ligaments and cartilages uh, the hyoid though it suspends the larynx uh, the hyoid bone is known part of the larynx um so this is your thyroid cartilage uh, this is your thyroid notch which is prominent in men and also known as your adam's apple this is your cricoid cartilage uh, between the cricoid cartilage and the thyroid that's where we have the crico thyroid ligament well, this is the place for crico thyroidotomy emergency airway uh, this is your thyrohyoid membrane and on lateral side we have the foramen which allows the passage of the internal branch of the superior laryngeal nerve and the um, superior laryngeal vessels. Um, then we, I think that is all. So the larynx is a musculocartilaginous structure lined by mucosa. It's connected to the superior part of the trachea and is continuous with the hypopharynx. Uh, it lies inferior to the tongue and the hyoid bone, but the hyoid bone is not part of the, the pharynx. It's essential sphincter guarding the entrance into the trachea. The larynx begins at the level C4 or C5 and ends at the level of C7. It is formed by nine cartilages and it is a cylindrical structure that is stabilized by the ligaments and eight skeletal muscles which are attached. to the cartilaginous um, one, its functions are determined by the position of the, by the position of the valve, as we shall see ahead. Uh, so triple function, the first function is it's an open valve during respiration. So when you are breathing, your vocal cords are apart. And so it allows air to pass through. Uh, the second, it's a partially closed valve whose orifice can be modulated in phonation. Like if you're talking, uh, your vocal cords a little bit are uh, adducted together so that you can be able to, uh, to speak. And third, it's a closed, completely closed valve uh, protecting the air trachea and bronchotry during swallowing. Coughing is only possible when the larynx can be closed effectively. So coughing is, is another protective mechanism um, that is as attached to the larynx to protect the lower airway. Its framework has the epiglottis, the thyroid cartilage, the cricoid, and the retinoid. Uh, this is a lateral view of your larynx, and you can see that uh, it's this is the epiglottis, this is your thyroid cartilage, and this is your cricoid. And this is the lumen of your, your, your larynx. And um, posteriorly, you can see this is the complete ring is the cricoid cartilage. Uh, this is uh, an indirect laryngoscopic view. And you cannot, this is the basal tongue. And this is the median glossoepiglottic fold that we saw and between the base of the tongue and the epiglottis we have the space we now know as the vallecula. Um, 
we have the false vocal cords and the true vocal cords. The, the reason why these are called false vocal cords is because one, they do not contain muscle. So they contain the vestibular ligament, which is part of your quadrilangular membrane. You don't need to know about that, but just know that these false vocal cords contain the ligament. And the true vocal cords, uh, they contain the muscle, which we call the vocalis muscle, also known as part of the thyro, thyro epiglottic muscle, uh, thyro arachnoid muscle. So the muscle that uh, plays a role in your formation uh, is attaches to the thyroid cartilage anteriorly and to the vocal process of the arachnoid cartilage posteriorly. And your true vocal cords, um, they appear white in color because after the mucosa, they, they have five layers. Five layers uh, make up your vocal cord. And after the mucosa, we note that beneath the mucosa, you have what we call the rain cast space. And the rain cast space is devoid. It's, it's devoid of vascular lymphatic channels. So that's why the true vocal cords appear pale. Uh, so the cartilages of the uh, larynx are nine, uh, but they are three paired and three unpaired. So the three paired make six, and the three unpaired make the three. So three plus six, that is nine. The paired, we have the arachnoid, the corniculate. Thank you. Uh, sorry, my network was. Can you hear me? Hello. Yes, sorry, but it is still. The internet is a little bit unstable. Yes, uh, doctor, we can hear you. So, but you can hear now. The data. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, I am sorry, the internet is a little bit unstable, but we are talking about um, cartilages of the larynx. We said we have paired and unpaired, and um, the paired, we said we have the original corniculate and cuneiform, whereas the unpaired, we have the thyroid, cricoid, and epiglottis. Uh, important laryngeal joints, we have the cricothyroid joint and the cricothyroid joint. The cricothyroid joint is between the inferior cornea of the thyroid cartilage and the facet of the cricoid cartilage at the junction of the arch and the lamina. It has two movements, which is rotation and gliding. This, this, um, then the cricoarachnoid joint um, is between the base of the arachnoid cartilage and the facet of the upper border of the lamina of the cricoid cartilage. Uh, its function are also for rotation and gliding. These two muscles, they, they help to, these two joints are very important because all the muscle, muscular attachments of the larynx help to cause the movement of these joints. Either when you're protecting the airway, or when you're phonating, speaking, or when you're breathing. Uh, the muscles of the larynx, well, we have the extrinsic and intrinsic. Uh, the extrinsic, we have the depressor group, uh, that's also called the strap muscles, where we have the omohyoid, uh, the steno, thyroid, all the thyroid muscles. 
And then we also have the elevator group. The elevator group, we have the gastric, those, those muscles that are born above the hyoid bone and the gastric muscle, the genial hyoid, the glossal hyoid. So all those muscles that are above the hyoid bone are elevator group. These ones contract and elevate the larynx when you're swallowing. Then we have the constrictor muscles and the pharyngeal muscles. The constrictor and the longitudinal muscles, we saw that they are part of your pharynx. The intrinsic muscles, uh, these are muscles that help to influence the size of your rima glottidis. The rima glottidis is the space between the true focal pods. So the intrinsic muscles, one, we have the interarachnoid muscle. The interarachnoid muscle, these are muscles formed between your arachnoid cartilages. And we have the transverse and oblique, as we saw in the video. Then we also have the posterior cricoid arachnoid muscle, which is the principal adductor muscle, the PCA. Then we have the lateral cricoid arachnoid muscle, which is an uh, adductor. So the principal abductor muscle is the PCA, the posterior cricoid arachnoid muscle, which is responsible for maintaining your airway. Uh, we have the thyroarachnoid muscle, which is part of your it's an abductor, but also when it's an adductor, it brings the vocal cords together, but it also gives you the part of the vocalis muscle, which is formed in your true vocal cord, and the cricothyroid muscle, which we find outside the, the larynx, as we noted, and it's responsible for tensing your vocal cords. Uh, the extrinsic ligaments, we saw that the cricothyroid membrane or ligament, we use it. You see where the red line is? Uh, that's why we put a cricothyroid. You've seen in the movies where they try and find the airway because you see the point, this point at your thyroid cartilage. That's where your true vocal cords are attached. They're attached from the retinoid cartilage to the thyroid cartilage. So above, we have the true vocal cords and below you have what we call your cricothyroid ligament why the magnus airway is placed um we so the space between your true vocal cords as we you can see now is what we call the rima glottidis and this space is open when you're breathing, partially closed when you're talking, and completely closed for protection of your airway. And this is the normal image that we should see in the clinic. Um, the larynx is divided into three parts. We have the supraglottis, the glottis, and the subglottis. As you can see, the, sub, the supraglottis is divided into the vestibule, and the ventricles. The vestibule is the entrance into your larynx, and the ventricle is that projection on either side of your post vocal cords. So the ventricle, together with the ventricle, together with the vestibule, they form your supraglottis. And from the upper border of your true vocal cords to two millimeters below the vocal cords, that's where you have the glottis. And from the two millimeter below the true vocal cords to the lower border of your cricoid cartilage, that's where you have your sub glottis. So we have the supraglottis, glottis and subglottis, and the supraglottis has the vestibule and the ventricle. Uh, as we saw, we have the false vocal cords and the true vocal cords. The false vocal cords only contain a, a ligament, the ventricular ligament, whereas the true vocal cords contain the muscle, which is the vocalis muscle, part of the thyroid muscle, and is responsible for voice production and 
protection of your area. The mucous membrane that lines the larynx is stratified epithelium, stratified squamous epithelium over the vocal cords and the upper part of the vestibule. Uh, the rest is ciliated columnar epithelium, which is part of the respiratory epithelium. The nerve supply is from the superior laryngeal nerve and the inferior laryngeal nerve. All these nerves are branches of the vagus nerve. And this is what we saw in the video. So we have the superior laryngeal nerve, which gives you the internal and external branches. And then we have the current laryngeal nerve, which loops around the iota on the left side. You see, it loops around the iota and also loops around the subclavian artery on the right side to travel through the tracheal esophageal group. A blood supply, uh, the upper larynx comes from the superior laryngeal uh, artery, which is a branch of the superior thyroid artery, which comes from the external carotene. The lower larynx, it comes from the inferior laryngeal artery, which is a branch of the inferior thyroid artery, which is a branch of the thyrocervical artery coming from the subclavian artery. Venous drainage ends up in the internal jugular vein in the upper larynx and the innominate vein in the lower larynx. Our lymphatic drainage goes to the deep cervical lymph nodes. Um, level, we have level five and uh, level six, the anterior compartment uh, that you shall read. So the basic functions we saw protection, respiration and and phonation. And we say the rima glottidis is completely closed during protection. And in respiration, your rima glottidis is open. And when you're speaking, they are both opposed together. And this is what we are showing. So when you're speaking, and the vocal cords um, are, are adapted together, and then you have air building in the trachea, and it ex ex escapes causing vibration of the vocal cords and thus phonation. Voice is later modified by the oropharynx, nasopharynx, and the tongue. Thank you. Do we have any questions? That's the end of the slide. Hello? Hello? Yes, doctor, we can hear you. Thank you so much. There is one hand up and I'll allow Elvis. Tamale, unmute and ask your question. Yes. Good morning, doctor. Um, Good morning like, to you. So I'd like to appreciate you for the well delivered lecture. Uh, my question you. is in all this that you've studied, what are the key clinical significances that we should pick out and always look out for? Okay. Um, um, so the first clinical significance is um, our own, comes when we are dealing with children and uh, they come in with snoring and mouth breathing and nasal obstruction. You should always look out for the size of the adenoids and the tonsils. Because when they enlarge or when children get adenotonsil hypertrophy, they can get uh, apneic spells and they stop breathing and they may need either medical treatment or surgery, as we shall see later on. Um, the other clinical significance are the areas. Um, in case a patient in, in just or swallows um, a fish bone, it can either be stuck in the tonsillar pillars or tonsillar bed where the tonsils are, all the lecula, the space between the base of tongue and the epiglottis, 
all the piriform sinus, that is the part of the hypopharynx. Um, we also have to note that in case of any emergency airway, don't forget the cricothyroid membrane. You can do cricothyroidotomy and that can save a patient um, as you buy time for a trapezium. Okay. Any question? Yes, Mulungi, ask your question. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Doctor. So in relation to in relation to voice, uh when people are having uh, after intubation, some sometimes people will lose the ability or to have their voices heard in case someone has, uh, has come up from an ICU or so, Okay, uh, so Murungi, if I can uh, take you to the slide of, um, of the vocal cord, uh, this image. So when you do direct laryngoscopy in theater to try and intubate the patient, you place your tube between these two. So you pass in between the remaglutidis to enter into the trachea. So this is why you position your, tra your endotracheal tube. So sometimes in cases of prolonged intubation, the, we get edema of the two vocal cords, but also you can sometimes dislocate your cricoarytenoid joint. In case, for example, you half the tube and accidentally you cut it at the rima glottidis. That's why it's very important when you do intubation, you should one, know the length of your tube in relationship to the incisor teeth and the level of the glottis. And you should be able to visualize and say that you pass your path and place it below the vocal cords before you balloon. So if you don't do that, one, you cause vocal cord edema, but two, you can also cause subluxation of the cricoarytenoid joint, which is important for rotating and gliding when you are speaking or when you are breathing. Okay, next question. Paddy, hello? Yes, I can hear you. Let me have uh, Nathan Murungi. Then I think the last question from will be from Mwangi. Okay. Yes, thank you very much, Doctor. My lecture. Mm. My question is about mm. uh, these true vocal cords. Uh, when we were mm. uh, in high school, we used to have some choir practice, and then you find some people put in tenor, some in bass, some in alto, and then finally you find people put in voice X. That they can't <laughs> make any of those voices. Now, mm. is the problem with the contraction of, is there a problem with the modification of the sound, the problem with the relaxation and contraction of these vocal cords? Where exactly is the problem? Because we had some people who, who really suffered, even if they tried, they couldn't do anything. Thank you. Okay, uh, one, I, I, I think one, it's talent, it's God given, but two, it's the position of your, your thyroid notch your Adam's apple. You've seen in men, the third, uh, that angle of the Adam's apple is a little bit acute. So you have a, a horse, a base, base, like your voice is base. Whereas in, in us women, we have a wider angle. So we have, we have a smaller angle, but not um, like our vocal cords are not long. So our voice, Voices are soft. So one about your um your arachnoid, your your position of the Adam's apple, and, and two, it's other factors that come into play. One, we say that in order to speak, you need to be able to hold to 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 let air pass over your vocal cords in order to cause them to vibrate. Okay. 
So this air that comes from the chest, uh, some people know how to hold it like the opera singers. You have to, to keep the air into, in your chest to, to sing that high pitch sound. So, so it's all about the contraction and relaxation of the muscles of the vocalist muscle and the intrinsic muscles playing around with them to produce sound. Okay, so it's about the person. It's, it's about the person. If you can hold air in your stomach, you can see. If you can modify your tongue to manipulate some sounds which are based on the tongue, you can do better. If you're a man, most likely you sing bass or tenor. And if a woman soprano, most likely because of the orientation of your Adam's apple. Okay, last question. Then you are signing for today. Yes. Mwange, unmute and ask your question. Thank you very much, Doctor. Uh, I think the question is partially answered, but then mm. uh, because I want to know why males have the thick voice and the females have the small one, but then also. Mm. Realize that usually big men in size have mm. tiny voices. And I'm wondering what really causes that because they seem to be big enough. And I mean, I don't expect the big voice out of them, but then they have this more sharp voice. What brings that? <laughs> that that's because of the, their oh. intrathoracic volume is reduced by the fat. So they don't oh. have a lot of air that is passing over. Yes, that, that's <laughs> passing over the true vocal cords. So the assignment is uh, list five differences between a pediatric and adult larynx. Five differences. Differences. between a pediatric and adult pediatric and adult larynx okay. deadline friday 5 friday Okay. Uh, thank you, everybody. I hope you were able to understand the lecture. I will see you yes, we have. next week. I will see you next week. Okay. Thank you. Then Dr. Dr. Ruth will come in after next week. So we shall okay. have two lectures interchanging. Yes, please. Uh, Nothing much. Okay. <laughs> Bye for now.